Uh, well, like I said, um, in the sermon, we're really going to be thinking about infant baptism. As we look forward to the baptism of little Darcy, uh, we're going to think about why we do this as a church and what baptism means and how it encourages us by pointing us to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, just as a matter of interest, please raise your hand if you were baptized as an infant. Yeah, interesting. Uh, please raise your hand if you were baptized as an adult. Yeah, interesting. You may put down your hands. <laughs> yeah. No, fascinating. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 28. So Matthew 28, uh, the Lord Jesus has died, risen, appeared to his disciples, and now these are his final words to his disciples before he ascends to be with his Father in heaven. So I'll start reading at verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always." to the end of the age. Uh, will you pray with me now? Lord God Almighty, you know that our desire as your people is that we want to be people of the book. We want to live lives under the submission of your scriptures day by day. We want to live as followers of Jesus, and we want to be those who stay close to the words that you have spoken. And so, Lord, we pray that as we think together about this wonderful uh, sign of baptism, that you would lead us and guide us through the Scriptures, that your Holy Spirit would be with us, and that you would point us afresh to Jesus Christ, that we might believe in him and trust only in his sacrificial death for us. And we pray this in the name of our risen Lord. Amen. Uh, well, these next two weeks, we have the wonderful privilege of witnessing the baptism of little Darcy this week, and then little Charlie next week. And hopefully you'll be aware are that this is our practice as a church, that in line with most Protestants historically, and especially the Reformed, Presbyterian, and Anglican branches of the church, uh, we believe that baptism ought to be given to believing adults and to their children. Now, from the get-go, it's worth noting that this is not a first order or a gospel issue. Are there a faithful Bible-believing, gospel-trusting Christians on both sides of the debate, right? It's not a make-or-break issue. It's not closed hand. However, oh, this is important. Oh, we serve the God of truth, and so God's truth always matters. And actually, this is very important practically. Uh, if the Baptists are right and only believing adults ought to be baptized, then actually many of us who are baptized as infants uh, weren't baptized properly and should be re-baptized. And actually, if we're right, then sadly, Baptists are withholding from their children a wonderful gift from our covenant God. So while this isn't a first order or a gospel issue, uh, this is important and worth considering deeply. Now, there's a view of baptism these days which goes something like this. Our baptism is a mark 
of believing in Jesus. Uh, there's a clear pattern in the New Testament that people believed and then were baptized. Our baptism is a declaration we make to Jesus. Just like to join the scouts, you have to stand up and say the scouts' oath, so to join the church, you have to stand up and say, I'm a Christian, I belong to Christ, and be baptized. However, our infants can't understand the gospel. Infants don't have the cognitive ability to believe upon Jesus. Therefore, infants should not be baptized. Case closed, simple, tidy, seemingly logical. And my view, hope is that actually this sermon will be a gentle challenge to that view, to say that actually the case isn't closed. And so I want to try and convince you, or for many of you, remind you that infant baptism is biblical and that infant baptism is beautiful. Now, we're going to be taking a big picture approach, right? We're going to be flying at 100,000 feet, so we're not going to be able to cover every single detail or answer every single question. But we're going to think about this under three parts, and the first part is the roots of baptism, the roots of baptism. Uh, One of the most basic building blocks to understanding the Bible is to realize that the Bible is covenantal. What does that mean? Well, basically, it means that the Bible is structured around covenants or binding solemn agreements between God and his people. That all the way from Genesis at the start of the Bible to Revelation at the end of the Bible, God constantly relates to creatures through covenants. And so the passage that Alex read for us earlier, Genesis 17, while not directly related to baptism, is very helpful to us in understanding the mechanics of how covenants work in the Bible. So, if you turn with me to Genesis 17, where you read earlier, uh, God appears to Abraham, or Abram, and he announces that he is going to make a covenant with him. Covenants in the Bible are consistently God-initiated. God didn't have to appear to Abraham. God didn't have to make these wonderful promises to him but he chooses to out of his kindness, goodness, and his grace. As part of this covenant, God makes promises to Abraham. In verse four, he says, you'll be the father of nations. In verse six, he says, kings will come from you. In verse eight, he says, I'll give you the land of Canaan. And then in verse seven, he says, I will be God to you and to your offspring after you. So note that while this was Uh, There were physical aspects to this covenant, uh, land um, and descendants, yet this was a spiritual covenant, a covenant that was marked by that golden promise that runs through the pages of Scripture, I will be your God and you will be my people. And God attaches a mark or an outward sign to this covenant. If you look with me at verse 11, He says, you shall be circumcised in the foreskin of your flesh, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Right? It's much like we have wedding rings as an outward sign of the vows that were made uh, between husband and wife. Now, when you read through the Bible, covenants repeatedly have covenant signs attached to them. Covenant with Noah, rainbow. A covenant with Um, Abraham here, circumcision, covenant with Moses at Sinai, Sabbath. So covenants repeatedly have covenant signs. So if you look at this passage here in Genesis 17, who was this sign for? Or what did it signify? Uh, Was it one, a sign of Abraham's faith declared to God? Or was it two, a sign of God's faithfulness declared to Abraham and his descendants. And in this case, it was certainly the latter, that while Abraham certainly was devoting himself to God, circumcision was primarily supposed to be a sign 
of God's faithfulness to keep the promises he has just made in this chapter. So the covenant, so it's kind of the idea that just as circumcision marked being separated or cutting off, so it was a mark that the people of Israel were separated to belong to God alone. It's a little bit like uh, when you go to a JP's office, a justice of the peace, and you've got a scanned passport photo, and you give it to the JP, and they look over it carefully, making sure it's authentic, and if it's authentic, they then stamp it with their stamp. And that stamp signifies that this is an authentic document. It can be trusted, it's reliable. And that's really how covenant signs in the Bible work. They are seals of God's promises. They're like the JP's stamp that says you can trust that this is true, reliable, and trustworthy. So within Israel in the Old Testament, circumcision functioned as a witness to Israel in every generation. That each time the community of Israel saw uh, either a newborn infant circumcised or an adult who came in from the surrounding nations circumcised, it was a reminder to them as a community that God will keep his promises. That as a community, that they were separated to belong to God and him alone. So circumcision was a deeply spiritual sign that was given to Abraham and to his descendants after him, given to uncomprehending infants, given to Esau as well as to Jacob given to Ishmael as well as to Isaac. It didn't change them. It didn't magically give them faith. It wasn't primarily a sign of believing, but instead it was a call to believing, a call to believe and keep on believing. So hopefully you've been able to connect some of the dots and see how this relates somewhat to how we think about baptism that actually many of the objections made against infant baptism have actually already been answered in infant circumcision. Now, how can a sign of belonging to God be given to an infant who can't understand or believe? Well, actually, that's exactly what God's been doing since the beginning of the Bible. You see, perhaps the greatest difference between our view and that of the Baptists is that they view baptism as primarily a declaration we make to God, while we view baptism as, a prim- as primarily a declaration that God makes to us. You see, when it comes to baptism, just like it comes to GPS in your car, our direction matters. In a slightly different context, the great British writer C.S. Lewis Uh, He once talked about people joining a conversation at 9 p.m. that started at 6 p.m. and then wondering why they're struggling to follow along. And it's a bit like that when it comes to baptism. That when it comes to how covenants and covenant signs work, actually the major talking points have already been covered in the Old Testament. So to skip the Old Testament and jump straight to the New Testament is to miss three vital hours of prior conversation. So firstly, we've got the roots of baptism. Secondly, we've got the meaning of baptism. Enter the New Testament. Now, whether or not you agree that baptism replaces circumcision, you have to admit that there's some quite striking similarities. In the Old Testament, circumcision was a mark of belonging to the outward people of God. It didn't guarantee faith, but whether you came in by birth or came in from the outside, you had to be circumcised. In the New Testament, baptism is a mark of belonging to the outward people of God. It doesn't guarantee faith, right? You can think of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5, or Simon the Magician in Acts 8, but once again, it marks that you belong to the outward people of God. In the Old Testament, circumcision uh, signified God's promises and that they belong to him. In the New Testament, our baptism signifies God's promises 
his promises through the gospel and that they belong to him. Circumcision looks forward to Jesus' circumcision, while baptism looks back to Jesus' baptism. Or later, you can look at Colossians 2.11, where you can see that actually Paul assumes there is an overlap of uh, significance or symbolism between baptism and circumcision. Or maybe to come at it from a different angle, that actually if baptism does function in the New Testament, the same way that circumcision functioned in the Old Testament, then what would we expect to see? What would we expect to see? Well, I'd argue that we would expect to see that actually the New Testament doesn't need to go into this in great detail because the basic principle hasn't changed and it's already been explained. You see, the silence of the New Testament on infant baptism is actually a lot less concerning to us than it is to the Baptist. Because the New Testament is incredibly specific in in noting where there are any changes. Right? Food laws, ceremonial laws, worshipping at the temple. The New Testament always explicitly says, this is no longer the case for New Testament Christians. And yet children had been included in God's covenant consistently through the Old Testament. They'd always been given God's covenant sign. And so from the Baptist view, you have to say that an age-old part of the way God had always dealt with his people has been revoked without a whisper or a murmur of dispute. I think last time I preached on it, I compared it to the haka, right? An age-old part of Kiwi culture is that the haka is performed before every All Blacks game. Right? It's how it's always been. It's what we've come to expect. Now, if that sacred tradition was suddenly taken away or revoked, there would be a vocal uh, response. There would be outrage. There would be heated discussion. There would be a need for extensive reasoning. But the one thing there wouldn't be is nothing. Just calm, soft silence. And yet that's effectively the Baptist case here. So we would expect that actually the New Testament doesn't need to talk about this a lot because nothing has changed. As Acts 2.39 says, the promise is still for you and for your children. But what's new is that it's more explicitly now for those who are far off, either Gentiles or non-Jews. What else would we expect? Well, we'd expect that the baptisms in the New Testament would predominantly be adult baptisms. Because actually the New Testament church and the book of Acts are in a missionary context. Right? There are next to no second generation Christians. So of course most of the baptisms are going to be adult baptisms. However, we might expect a few hints. And the hints are exactly what we're given in the household baptisms in Acts, which you can find in Acts chapter 16. Oh, we would expect that in Paul's letters, when he's writing to church churches, that actually church kids would be addressed not as outsiders to the kingdom, little devils in diapers, but actually as those who belong to God, those who are valuable to him. And again, that's exactly what you see. Right, you can see it in verses like Ephesians 6 2. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Or you can see it in Colossians 3 20. Now I recognize that I've belabored this point, and I could go on. But the point being that actually we are given every reason to believe that baptism continues to function like circumcision did as a covenant sign, as a seal not of our faith, but of God's faithfulness to his um, gospel promises. This is how the Reformed preacher Sinclair Ferguson put it. He said, if you ask some people what baptism means, the first thing they do is talk about themselves rather than talk about Jesus Christ. I'm trying to say that the central meaning of baptism is that it points us to the Lord Jesus first, not to ourselves. Baptism is a sign of the gospel.
You see, baptism is a living picture of the gospel truth. That just as you place your hands in the sink and water runs over them and the dirt flows away, so baptism is a sign or a picture of all of your sins being washed away through the blood of Jesus. As it says in Acts 22 and verse 16, be baptized and wash away your sins. You see, when we receive the sign of baptism by faith, whether that's as an adult, in the case of adult baptism, or later in life, in the case of infant baptism, actually baptism assures us that we belong to God, that we are marked as his own, that he has given us new life through union with Jesus, and that our sins have been washed away once and for all through Jesus on the cross. Now, maybe you've noticed, actually, in baptisms you've viewed, that actually in baptism we don't do anything, right? Whether you're an adult or you're a child, right, you just stand there or you're just held there and the water washes over you, right? You don't actually do anything. And actually that's a deliberate picture of the freeness of the gospel, a deliberate reminder that we don't do anything that we don't need to earn it or achieve it, but that actually we receive forgiveness as a free gift from the hand of Jesus. You see, if there are any uh, here this morning who don't yet know Jesus Christ, the baptism you're about to view is a picture of the gospel, that actually Jesus offers to wash you clean from your sin. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to show you're worthy of it. All you have to do is receive his kind gift. So actually, as Darcy receives the sign of baptism this morning, and then Charlie next Sunday morning, it won't change them. It won't magically ensure faith or, or change their nature. Right, there's only one way, one truth, one life, and that is through personal faith in Jesus Christ. But in baptism, God marks him as his own, and he stamps his seal that he will wash them clean from their sins if they believe in the Lord Jesus and come to him. So I've got the roots of baptism, the meaning of baptism, and thirdly and finally, the calling of baptism. So baptism is a picture. It's a picture of being washed clean from your sins. It's a picture of being united with Jesus in his death and in his resurrection. Uh, it's a picture of belonging to the people of God. And actually, it is also a naming ceremony. So in the passage we read right at the start, in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, Jesus says this. He says, Go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in or into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. The point being that actually in baptism, God places his very name upon us. You might think of it as being a little bit like adoptive parents who take their adopted child to the lawyers and request a legal name change. From that point onward, the adopted child bears the name of his adoptive parents. Now, it might be when the child is older and understands a bit more. It might be when the child is just a newborn and doesn't understand anything. But either way, the child now bears the name of his adoptive family. Nothing's changed in him or her. The child still needs to, to choose to live and behave as a member of the new family. But from now on, that child bears the name of his new adoptive family calling him or her to live in that wonderful new reality. And actually, that's the way baptism functions, that God places his name upon us, and he calls us to live in the reality that we now belong to him. And actually, isn't it wonderful that that's what our God is like? For all the parents who are here, isn't it wonderful that we have a God who cares about our children? Eric and Emily, 
Reuben and Sarah, isn't it wonderful that you have a God who places his very name upon your children? You see, in baptism, as it were, God takes the initiative with our kids. He doesn't just generally invite them to faith, like a generic ad in a newspaper inviting anyone or anything to come to an event. No, he personally invites them. As it were, writes a handwritten letter, delivered in person, requesting their presence by name. You see, baptism for our kids is a personal invitation to Christ and to the gospel. And so while everyone is commanded and has ample reason to believe in Jesus, church kids, baptized youth, you have more reason than most because you bear the very mark of God upon you. Uh, His promise to wash you clean from your sins if you only believe in Jesus and trust in him. You see, he's loved you before you were even born. He's been faithful to your parents before you. And through baptism, he continues to invite you to come and to belong to him. And so I wonder for all the church kids here this morning, actually, have you responded to Jesus' invitation to you? Are you currently living as a member of God's family? You see, maybe some of you, even this morning, need to come forward and put your faith in Jesus Christ. Trust in him and him alone. Not because your parents want you to. Not because of any sort of peer pressure. But because God loves you and has marked you as his own. And because Jesus died on the cross for the washing away of sins. And actually for all of us here this, e- here this morning who have been baptized and p- placed our trust in Jesus, your baptism calls you to keep believing in Jesus, to keep trusting only in the blood of Jesus Christ shed for your sin. Now one of our confessions puts it like this. It says, baptism benefits us not only when the water is on us and when we receive it, but throughout our whole life. This is what our forebears in the faith used to call improving our baptism. And it's the idea that as you witness a baptism like you're about to, or as you go through a season in your life where guilt haunts your every thought, where your sins seem like titanic waves about to break on you, or when temptation rages, that you deliberately look back in faith to your baptism and you tell yourself, I am baptized just as water washes away dirt so the blood of Jesus has washed away my sins and I am forgiven. You remind yourself, I'm baptized. Jesus has put his name upon me and now I belong to him. You remind yourself, I am baptized God has marked me as one of his children. He will keep every promise he has made to me. And the work he begun in me, he will surely bring to completion. You see, brothers and sisters, infant baptism is biblical and infant baptism is beautiful. And so as you view the water being poured over Darcy's head, know that God is faithful to his gospel. Know that God will never renege on even one of his promises. And know that through faith in Jesus, your sins are washed away and done away with for good. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we do thank you for the wonderful way that baptism is a picture and a sign of the gospel. That once again, Lord, it points us not to ourselves, not to our faith, not to anything we bring to the table, but instead only to you, Lord Jesus, and your wonderful work on the cross for us. Lord, we thank you for dying and rising. We thank you for uh, bearing the punishment for our sins. And we thank you that in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is washing and there is forgiveness. And so, Lord, we pray for each and every one of us. We pray that as we view this baptism, that we would believe more deeply in the Lord Jesus and that we would come to you with fresh faith and fresh repentance.
And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.